I'm going to try to argue that uh, Hobbesian anarchism is a coherent uh, thesis, and I'm also going to argue that Hobbesian minarchism is an incoherent thesis. Uh, first question I think should come to mind is why this paper? Uh, very few, if any, anarchists, uh, certainly anarcho-capitalists, uh, are Hobbesians. Uh, so what does it matter? I think one of the important things is that uh, most other people, most political theorists today, are either Hobbesian explicitly or certainly very uh, influenced by Hobbes, state of nature theory, this sort of stuff. And so it's important to be able to speak to, uh, about them and to them more on their own terms rather than sort of always uh, fighting on sort of the meta level, uh, you know, uh, foundational uh, disputes or something like that. Uh, the second part is there, there's, I think, a, a philosophical strength to arguing within an argument, uh, granting someone his or her premises and then working from within those as opposed to, again, sort of trying to clash head on uh, from foundational assumptions. And finally, I think it's just best not to whine. Uh, I'm projecting on people here, but I tend to get really annoyed when people don't see something that I see as obvious. And so I start sort of, you know, dragging my feet and, and wondering how they manage to tie their shoes in the morning. So um, this paper should present me from doing a little bit of that. Again, the point, I'm going to argue that Hobbesian anarchism is coherent and Hobbesian minarchism is not. Uh, I plan on going about it by isolating three from among possibly many necessary conditions for any political theory to be called Hobbesian, which is to say that any political theory to be called Hobbesian must uh, obtain all three of these conditions. This is not an, ex uh, an exhausted list, uh, just three I isolated from the text in Hobbes that are uh, important that he, he hits upon uh, several times. Um, I'm also going to show that minarchists, in this case an article by Michael Levin, uh, fail to satisfy at least one of the three, thereby um, uh, being a not a true Hobbesian position. And finally, I'm going to show that anarchism can what the hell is that? Uh, can show all three. You can't really see in the box, but uh, anarchism can satisfy all three. So let's start with Hobbes' framework. I'm going to be, can you help me out there? All right. Um, this is obviously incredibly brief. Up here about the first 24 chapters of book one and a paragraph. Uh, but I left nothing out, trust me. <laughs> Human beings naturally find themselves in a state of nature, a war of all against all. Rationally desiring peace, they elect a sovereign whose rule and guidance staves off the scenario. So there are three uh, necessary conditions uh, found <laughs> within that, uh, that paragraph. I think, uh, uh, one, the people in the state of nature are rational. Two, sovereign is established so that the war of all against all might end. And three, the sovereign must be a man or a group of men. Uh, by the people in the state of nature being rational, what I mean by that is they uh, have an ability to uh, recognize ends. They have an ability to recognize means um, uh, various means that will achieve those ends, they have the ability to adjudicate among those means to best reach those ends. In other words, they uh, desire their happiness and have at least in, uh, some way of maximizing that happiness, reaching towards that end in the best possible way. Um, I think that's important because in the state of nature, uh, rationality, um, so far as I can tell, implies that uh, people won't just choose any, any random sovereign, the first sovereign, uh, that maybe comes to somebody's mind, but they will actually be able to adjudicate among several possibilities for sovereignty. And Hobbes actually allows for that. He thinks, he envisions something like an election um, uh, to elect the sovereign. Uh, sovereignty is being established to end the war against, uh, of all against all. Um, I think that's, a, it's, it's, other than the fact that it's pretty bloody obvious that, that's in Hobbes, um, what that really means is that um, when the sovereign is elected, uh, he doesn't, the state of nature, uh, the state of humanity doesn't fundamentally change. Uh, the state of nature in the war of all against all is a rational response to uh, the goings-on of the world at that time. And um, simply because a sovereign comes about and makes the war uh, costly or even um, impossible doesn't mean that human beings have somehow changed in their nature. Um, and so when the sovereign is established to end the war, he's ending a war fought among human beings and is governing human beings. And nothing fundamentally changes in their nature after his election. And the third one, the sovereign must be a man or a group of men. Uh, again, that sounds fairly obvious. Uh, but uh, Hobbes himself was dealing with some people uh, at the time who were uh, sort of um, some form of mil millennialists or something who thought that um, God could be, pr primarily God could be a sovereign. And uh, Hobbes, for very good reasons, I think, uh, recognizes that, no, for, for men to be led out of the state of nature, it must be led out by a man or a group of men. 
So here's uh, Michael Levin's attempt to defend Hobbesian minarchism in his article, A Hobbesian Minimal State. He says, quote, There is, in spite of all of this, a clear sense in which the Hobbesian state is minimal. It is first minimal in intent. The sovereign's fundamental right is to secure us all against attack, primarily each other's attacks, and we give him our swords for this security. So we see then the purpose of sovereignty is to avoid violent death and the threat thereof. It is not concerned with education or access to food or, you know, uh, welfare, uh, health care, etc., right? Um, and that's because the sovereign's election ensures that the utility of violence is reduced. That is to say, the absence of swords, which is the gift of the sovereign, renders their utility obsolete. The absence of the plow does not. So what Michael Levin is saying is that, um, I mean, look, what do you use swords for? They're not very useful for anything other than hacking off limbs and fighting battles. And so when the sovereign comes in and takes everyone's sword away, they have no reason to fight any longer. They, he's got all the swords now. You're not brandishing your sword. I'm not brandishing my sword. And we tend to sort of back off one another. And now Levin points out that the, the sovereign can't do that with a plow. If he starts to sort of co-opt and uh, socialize uh, food, say, and food production, well, we're all still going to be hungry at the end of the day, right? So the absence of plow doesn't mean, of a plow doesn't mean that the utility of the plow is just obdurated, right? We still need them. So Levin thinks that the, that the, uh, the sovereign is a very unique, uh, institution because it only, con- it only concerns itself, um, with, again, the avoidance of death or threat thereof. And that's the job of the sovereign. Uh, so far as I can tell, there are at least two problems uh, with Levin's uh, proposition. One is a problem with his reading of Hobbes. I don't think he's Hobbesian. And two, it seems logical. Uh, first, uh, it's not Hobbesian because Levin has not met the second condition that I laid out. Humans are still humans even after the election of the sovereign. The sword is not made obsolete but more costly to use. What I mean by that is simply because the, the, the uh, sovereign takes away everyone's swords, doesn't mean that I still don't want to punch you in the face, right? It just means it's going to be a lot harder for me to kill you, and then if you, if the sovereign has all the swords, it makes it a lot easier for him to come down on me in retribution. But fundamentally, even after we've been lifted out of the state of nature, we're still the same human beings. The world is still fundamentally the same. The very same thing that made us hostile towards one another in the state of nature is still making us hostile towards one another now. It's just that the sovereign's there to make us think twice, maybe three or four times, before we decide to act in anger or something. Um, Hobbes is clear about this all over the place. So I don't think Levin has, has read Hobbes very well. Uh, second seems to be logical. Even if Levin's reading were Hobbesian, the power given to the sovereign could hardly be called minimal. Taking one sword and threatening him with it is an expansive power, not to mention taking the swords of an entire nation. I don't know how you could call that minimal, to de- disarm everybody and then threaten them with their own arms and then sort of throw it up and be like, whoa, hey, man. Let's not co-opt the education system. That's really expansive. All I'm doing is wanting to point all my guns at you and tell you how to, how to behave. just doesn't seem minimal in any coherent sense of the word. So the fate of Hobbesian minarchism, it's neither Hobbesian nor minarchist. And you may talk amongst yourselves. Okay. So Hobbesian anarchy. Anarchy means simply the absence of a state. Uh, the state is, as Murray Rothbard said, quote, that organization in society which attempts to maintain a monopoly of the use of force and violence in a given territorial area. And finally, I've added this word governance, which I um, have, uh, what word am I looking for here when you give the, de- def- define, thanks. Uh, uh, what arises from human interactions and is essentially the rules by which such interactions are most efficiently and successfully carried out. In short, governance is the organic and spontaneous rule and order which arises among interacting individuals. Now, my claim for a Hobbesian anarchist position is that we can have everything Hobbes wants uh, the sovereign to do uh, without the state and using something like governance. And I'll explain how that works here in a moment. So first off, why would people want to be anarchists uh, in the state of nature? Well, it's because they're rational, the first uh, sufficient condition, and they want to maximize their, um, their happiness And it's not at all clear to me that the state is better than the state of nature. In the state of nature, the constant threat of war is sufficient to be a state of war. Hobbes mentions, uh, he analogizes it to a storm. He says the conditions sufficient for a storm are necessary to call it stormy weather, right? It doesn't actually have to be lightning and actually be raining for us to sort of consider a storm. Likewise, if there's a constant and real enough threat of war, we might as well be at war, right? And we're all going to be brandishing our weapons. We're going to be constantly prepared to fight. 
Well, in the state, one lives under a constant threat of violence, right? I mean, that's, that's how the state survives. It's how the state uh, gets you to do what it wants. In short, with respect to the sovereign, people are still in the state of nature. So um, it's not clear to me at all that there's a difference between the state of nature and the state, and I think rational people, at least some, could think about it and could coherently reject a state in the state of nature. So because people wish to maximize their happiness, there must be other options. Well, I think the sovereign can be guided by governance that arises from human interaction and is embodied by each member of the commonwealth. No particular member is herself or himself the sovereign because governance only arises among individuals and not within a particular individual. Governance supervenes upon the individuals, individuals interacting but is not identical to any or any part of them. Thus, the second and third conditions have been satisfied. So what I mean by that is you can't really have governance with yourself. I mean, maybe in some really metaphorical sense, but governance only arises when there are individuals interacting. Now, that governance can be a guiding force and supervene upon individual members of a commonwealth such that we are eventually, essentially our own sovereign being guided by the governance which naturally arises uh, from among us. So that satisfies both the second and the third conditions. The sovereign is a is embodied by a man or a multitude of them and has lifted us out of the state of nature or something like that. So recapping, finally, there are my three uh, sufficient conditions again, or necessary conditions rather. People in the state of nature are rational, and underneath I say, wishing rationally to maximize their happiness, people in the state of nature could realize both that the state is hardly any different than the state of nature and that the power allotted to it could be worse yet than any power similarly constituted individuals might wield in the state of nature. And then two and three, sovereign, the sovereign is established that the war of all against all might end and the sovereign must be a man or a group of men. Each member of the commonwealth is himself an embodiment of sovereignty guided by governance in order that the war of all against all will end. So I actually think it's at least a coherent thesis. Now, I, I don't want to go in. I don't have the time nor the constitution to go to what this might look like, uh, how favorable it is. I'm not a Hobbesian. Um, but uh, my, my goal here was just to show that I think one can accept Hobbesian premises, uh, general Hobbesian inclinations, and still arrive coherently at anarchism. So, thank you.